There are three very interesting buildings, Road House in Kilkenny, the Archer House in, or part of the Archer House in Kilkenny, better known to many of you as the Hole in the Wall, um, and the Everard's Arms House in Fetterd, County Tipperary, um, I suppose better known as Fetterd Tulsa. Um, and they all date from a period between uh, 1580 and about 1610, so a very defined period of time and a very defined geographical area, which is the little triangle that you see there sort of straddling uh, Kilkenny and Tipperary and um, I suppose three key towns there, Fetterd where the Everard Arms House is, Kilkenny where Rose House and the Archer Mansion are, and then Carrigan Shore, which doesn't really form part of my lecture, other than to highlight this building, with which I've had no personal involvement, um, but it's hugely influential on the construction of um, the three buildings I'm talking about, and this is uh, Ormond Castle in uh, Carrigan Shore, which was built uh, or extended as a Tudor manor house um, in 1560 by the 10th Earl of Ormond, who was a direct first cousin of Queen Elizabeth I. Uh, he grew up in the court in London and was one of the inner circle in the court of Queen Elizabeth I, came back to Ireland, built this house in the English Renaissance style. So I'm sort of, even though the title of the lecture talks about 16th and 17th century buildings, essentially what we're dealing with here are three Renaissance buildings directly influenced by Ormond Castle, which in turn is directly influenced by what was happening in Tudor England during the Tudor Renaissance. So to start with Roth House um, in Kilkenny, which many of you may know, um, and when I talk about Roth House, I've given a few presentations over the years, I always like to start with these photographs, uh, which I took in 1983 as a fresh-faced uh, student. Um, we did a college project in second year in the School of Architecture in UCD and we all got on a bus and came down on a wet October day and this is what we found and it was a collection of buildings separated by courtyards, um, very very atmospheric and I suppose with the passage of time these photographs which I took on my dad's box brownie have become more atmospheric. Um, you can see, I suppose, maybe I should use the pointer. Um, this is the front house. You go through an archway. Second house remodeled in the 19th century. And then the third house, certainly in 1983, uh, was um, effectively a ruin with larger window openings on the first floor. And then behind that was a further courtyard there. Um, and behind that was the remains of the garden. So the site, uh, this is a model, a computer model that we did um, when we started working on the site in 2006. And I suppose I never thought in 1983, never dreamed that I would ever find myself in a position where I'd be carrying out work in Roth House. And for me, it was a huge privilege. Uh, and I also got to work with um, some very, very uh, interesting people. It was a great team. Uh, but in any event, w uh, this model, I think, sort of gives some representation of how Roth House was laid out. It was a series of three houses with three courtyards, and behind that was a garden, uh, which was a working garden, vegetable gardens, providing vegetables and fruit to the house. And behind that, again, was a very large orchard. Uh, the orchard was there, and at the far end of the orchard was the city wall. Now, Roth House is particularly important as... Um, one of the only, if not the only, intact Burgage plots uh, in Britain and Ireland. Uh, so a Burgage plot is a strip of land that stretches from the main street right back to the town wall, or the city wall. Um, and what you have here is a very, very intact representation of um, uh, how a merchant's house on a Burgage plot might have worked. The, the site itself, the Burgish plot, was laid out much, much earlier and was occupied by the Cistercians in the 14th century. So there are layers of history on this site. And I've given the dates of the three houses there. But the project I want to talk about, and I have worked on all of the buildings, but the garden, I think, is one that t ties into the theme of the conference and the interaction between uh, conservation architecture, archaeology, placemaking, and the economy. Uh, so that's the one I'm going to deal with. Um, very, very briefly on the history of the house, this is how the house looked like in the 19th century. 
with various modifications and you can see traces of um, uh, the, the original Tudor house. And then in the 1960s, the Kilkenny Archaeological Society, who are the real heroes of this story, acquired the house, uh, got a campaign going, got the Board of Public Works involved under Percy de Clare, who then carried out works in accordance with best conservation practice as it, as it applied in the 1960s. These drawings are very useful. And then the third house, sometime after my little student visit, uh, became the subject of a further project under a different team long before I was involved. And they drew up these um, survey drawings of the east facade, which clearly shows on the upper floor that the windows are not um, uh, 16th century, they're later. Um, and there were studies done as to how the building would be presented. And this was the final outcome. And some of you may recall this was the home of the Heritage Council uh, during the 1990s and 2000s. Um, and there's a fair bit of conjecture involved, I think it's fair to say, in how that building was restored. Um, but it predates a lot of the conservation legislation that we operate under now. Um, skipping forward to 2002, the Heritage Council uh, carried out a, or commissioned a multidisciplinary conservation plan to look at all aspects of the house. And, and this comment, I think, is, a, is, is one that jumps out from the page, which states that while the conservation works have been heavy handed by modern standards, uh, the complex is remarkably favourable to the original and is uniquely open to the public. Um, I think the word heavy-handed may be a little bit ungenerous. I think they were done with the best of intentions in accordance with how things were done at the time. A and what's critically important is that over a period of 50 years, the site gradually begun began to come together and there was an opportunity to present it as a single burgage plot entity. So a couple of key recommendations from the Heritage Council um, Conservation Plan. Um, firstly, the formation of a uh, not-for-profit um, entity to run the day-to-day -day running of the house and to commission and undertake the projects, hugely important. The great work that the Kenny Archaeological Society have done and continue to do is amazing, but a structure clearly was required to drive the thing forward. Um, the second thing was the restoration of the garden as a key part of the site that needed to be exploited. Uh, the third thing linked into that was the opportunity to present, present the site as a single entity for the first time since 1654, which was when the Roth family left Kilkenny. Um, another recommendation just to highlight was to set up a series of five yearly quinquennial inspections, uh, which I, I've undertaken too during my time there, which involves getting cherry pickers, getting in and around, around the buildings, troubleshooting, checking gutters, checking flashings, trying to spot problems before they arise and deal with them. And then the principle of having a, uh, putting together a multidisciplinary expert steering group for each of the projects. That was critically important on the garden project I'm going to show you now. So in 2006, substantial funding was made available by Fort Charlotte uh, for the full restoration of the garden in Roth House. And, and the work was to be carried out in accordance with the, the conservation plan. However, the timeline for the implementation of the project was unbelievably tight, and anyone who's ever worked with grant assistance um, and grant funding in, um, in Ireland knows that you, you, you grab the money and you run with it, even though sometimes the timelines aren't appropriate. But you, the one thing you don't do is give the money back, uh, and you use it as best you possibly can. Um, and key to this, in the case of this project, was having the expert group in place. So we were constantly looking at ways to um, drive the project forward while still giving us time to do the appropriate research so that we were getting the, the end outcome to be quite faithful. Um, this is the garden site as it presented to us in 2006. There was a lower yard which had been used by the Office of Public Works as a depot. Um, and the site was naturally sloped, but actually it had been levelled. So the foundations of the walls on either side had been eroded as a result of digging into the side of the hill. <clears throat> and of course, this also had an impact on surviving archaeology below the ground. And you can see at the back of this photograph, the second photograph, which is looking towards um, the city wall. The city wall isn't the wall that you see at the back of the yard. That's a retaining wall that divided the front yard from the backyard. And you can sort of see, if you look at the break line on the wall,
just about there, there was one metre of retaining wall, and that was the extent of ground that had been cut away that we had to deal with. Um, and this was a survey drawing by Phelan Manning um, prior to the commencement of the project, uh, which shows the top yard and the bottom yard and, and the subdivision of the garden site bore no relationship to how it would have been laid out during John Rose's time. Um, there are a number of drawings by Phelan Manning throughout my presentation and I, I just want to highlight the importance when you're dealing with above ground remains of having a very, very good stone accurate set of drawings to work from. And this was a key intervention, one of the key tools that we used on this project. Other key sources, one very important one was a very, very detailed will which John Roth left, um, describing in detail the layout of the garden, the planting of the garden, the layout of the house, the large cellar to the front, etc., etc. So it's a, it's a written description that goes way beyond what we would expect to find in a modern will and really was an important document in trying to piece together the gaps. Obviously, the upstanding remains, also critically important. Um, a geophysical survey of the site, which is effectively this ground penetrating radar that uh, Tim Butler was talking about earlier. It's a bit like an ultrasound where you're trying to see can you see shadows of stuff under the ground and that then informs, particularly on a project where time is tight, where you do the excavation and how you do the excavation. And then following on from that was selected ex excavations as we went along. And, and all of that yielded a huge amount of material. Again, the expert group working hand in glove with the team of archaeologists and the conservation architect. I've mentioned Phelan Manning. The other key people here would have been Ben Murter, who many of you who've worked in Kilkenny may know, uh, who's a really, really good archaeologist at looking at upstanding remains and tracing the story that the stones tell. Um, and also Colin O'Driscoll, who other speakers have mentioned, who was involved on this and the other projects. Um, and this is a section through the site that just highlights in the red shaded area the, the part of the site that had been excavated. So really, um, we were looking for decent archaeology down at the tapering end of this red triangle. So, sorry, this end. That end there. Um, and the further up the slope you went, or the, the slope that was now gone, the less archaeology was there. Um, and this red, this red triangle also illustrates the amount of land we had to actually put back with infill, uh, which was quite a challenge in a busy town centre site with a six-month timeline. Um, so managing the accelerated programme, um, we, the steering group, I, I suppose as the conservation architect, I was reporting into the steering group and the implementation group. Um, and we met every week, and it was a huge demand on everybody's time, um, but everybody rolled up their sleeves and was, was committed to the project. We started in the spring of 2007 with a small project to repair the upstanding walls. Those walls didn't need that much investigation. This was a repair and consolidation job, and we had a, a contractor working on that. In parallel, excavations were carried out to identify surviving below-ground footings, and the top <coughs> photograph shows uh, us excavating along the line of where the dividing wall between the vegetable garden and the orchard was. The geophysical survey came back and then there was analysis by the expert group as to what that meant, right down to the layout of the planting beds. So a lot of work happening and different plates spinning at different speeds uh, and just trying to keep on top of it. And then the second phase of the project began in the summer of 2007. And that involved building new walls on the footings of, of previous walls that were there, sometimes building directly onto the stone rubble footings with stone and lime mortar in the traditional way, reinstating the slope of the hill and forming the planting beds. And this was done with a separate contractor, um, and we were very fortunate that we got free stone and soil and use of a yard as a staging area very close to the site. Um, and the expert steering group were at this stage involved in looking at planting, analysis of seed samples that were retrieved by the archaeologists, tracking down um, appropriate uh, planting that would have been used at the time. There's a great organisation called Seed Savers, uh, I think they're based down in Limerick, if I'm correct, who were very useful in there, looking at garden furniture design uh, and how the whole site was presented. So we were constantly running one step ahead of the implementation. And this was the end result in the winter of 2007. It looks a bit barren, but you can see clearly the vegetable garden 
towards the front and the foreground, uh, a vinery, uh, which is the oak structure with, with the, the vaulted roof down in the corner, the dividing wall, and then behind the dividing wall, which, what looks a little bit sad uh, at the moment there, is the site of the orchard. And uh, as you will imagine, with trees, that takes some time. Okay, I have to speed up dramatically here. Um, and this is the aerial view of the completed garden. I just want to draw your attention to the circle at the back wall, um, uh, dividing the, the vegetable garden from the orchard, which is an old Cistercian well, um, which we've interpreted, interpreted, as you can see in the bottom uh, photograph there. And then that's just a view of the third house. Um, and just to pay tribute to the team, and there's a photograph of some of the team, some of whom are in the room, I can see two of them down there. Moving on to the Archer House, um, built roughly the same time, Rose Archer uh, married uh, John Roth. So these were two large merchant families. There were about 12, I think, very similar sized merchants' houses in Kilkenny of a similar scale to Roth House. Uh, and on this project, we were dealing with a small building towards the rear, um, which is just a fragment of a much larger house, and it presents as a hidden treasure hidden down the laneway. Um, so the area we're dealing with is the blue area, um, which was purchased by our client, who is a private um, individual, uh, I suppose, who wanted to take the project on as a not-for-profit venture to restore part of um, our heritage. And then the pink-purple area to the side is a ruined uh, and still undeveloped section of the house which survives. The rest of the house is buried within 19th century and 18th century buildings towards the front. And these are just some images of what we were presented with at the beginning. You can clearly see the Tudor or Renaissance windows. Um, and this is a fragment of the, the ruined section which we weren't working on. Which, so the bit we were working on was part of a much larger whole. And key, key dates. The building was constructed in 1582. Crucially, it was used in the late 18th century as a tavern, visited by luminaries such as Henry Grattan and the Duke of Wellington. So a lot of history there and changes at a much later date from the original construction. And then our client, Dr. Michael Conway, who um, is speaking later this evening and giving a tour of, of the hole in the wall, acquired the building in 1999, a very dynamic and driven individual. And then over a period of time, uh, effectively an eight, nine year period, we did the research and did the projects in stages with funding where available from grants. And these are more drawings from Phelan Marling that again highlight the importance of having the stone accurate surveys to work from. Um, there are modern window openings that were left and we interpreted them as, uh, as being inserts uh, because we weren't trying to restore the house to a single period in time. Um, but key things like putting back the correct roof slope, putting back missing chimneys were central to the success of the project. So these drawings I think just show you the importance of having good archaeological records as a starting point that you can then interrogate. Um, and you can see here the, the uh, metal roof that was on the building and the clear gable line of the earlier roof. And then we took those drawings, superimposed them onto CAD drawings, and then they formed the basis of our uh, detailed drawings that went to the contractor. <clears throat> you can see the survival of some oak beams on the um, first floor structure there, which are of interest. So the, the works were phased. We started by um, consolidating the walls, um, putting back the slope of the roof, um, and gradually pulling the building together, um, putting back the chimneys, putting in uh, glazing into the windows, just to pause for a slight section, a second to highlight the discovery of some earlier cobblestones below the level of 18th century paving, which is on the, the below the grid in the um, this side, uh, and we tried to interpret that. And then on the interior, it's quirky, it's more quirky than Roth House, and it reflects the personality of the client. Um, and that's not a bad thing. I think there are different ways of presenting these buildings. Um, but the large room on the first floor was presented as a single room. It would have been two stories, and we've kept a mezzanine, um, which you can see in the staircase on that side. Not accessible to the public, but at least it interprets the fact that this was a three-storey building. We put back an oak truss. We were delighted to be able to use the walls as load-bearing structures. And then there were some leftover beams that weren't of the full size and some 18th century windows that we ended up using at the client's request as the bar counter. And um, some of you may have been in there last night or may get the opportunity 
to prop up the bar there this evening, but it's a very special experience. Um, and just to say, it's, it's, it's made a significant contribution, I think, to the cultural offering and tourism offering in Kilkenny in a very different way to Roadhouse. And just to quickly flash up the team there, uh, who were tremendously important, uh, I suppose just to mention contractors like George O'Malley and Tallis and Company, who both worked on Roadhouse and on um, the Hole in the Wall, uh, and, and just a great team. Very briefly then, the final project is the Everard Arms House. Obviously, I could talk about each of these buildings for much, much longer, and I apologise that it's a whistle-stop tour, but I think there are connections between the three that are worth making on a day like today. Um, so the Everard Arms House was constructed um, by a wealthy family, the, the Everards. This is how it looked the day I visited it on the first occasion in 2011. Um, and I think the key observation I had about Fetard was that behind what is a Victorian main street, and a very fine Victorian main street, lies this hidden wonderland of the walled town um, and, and the Holy Trinity Church and very intact tower gates. And you get no sense of that when you're on the main street. Uh, I drive through Fetard a fair bit, and every time I do it, I sort of alternate between driving down the main street and experiencing what's a very fine town centre, and then going around the back and experiencing the, uh, the walled town. Um, the market, the Fetterd Tulsil, the Everard Arms House, opens onto the old market square and there are various photographs that show this as, a, as an important social space over time. The building had been used uh, after its use as an arms house, it was converted to the town hall, um, then it was a courthouse and then it was used as a fire station and it was also the place where the country markets was formed. So layers of social history as well as physical history. And you can see in the black and white photograph how one side of the building effectively got radically altered in the 19th century and became sort of a two-story residential shop. Um, so looking at these layers of history, you have the uh, construction of the arm, arms house by Sir John Everard, who was another wealthy individual from the same mould as John Roth and the Archer family. And these traces are very, very clear Tudor details. Then you have the 18th century alterations, most particularly uh, square-headed window openings and the large staircase that led up to what was the town hall chamber. Um, and then 19th century alterations, mainly on the end of the building where the 19th century residential shop was. Um, and this photograph from 1989, when they re-rendered the building, shows traces, particularly at first floor level, of blocked window openings uh, and also um, early 17th century commemorative plaques. Um, this was a useful drawing. Um, unfortunately, they rendered in uh, cement, or perhaps fortunately, because it gave us the opportunity to strip it all back again, uh, which revealed certain things. Um, I did a feasibility study, first of all, made recommendations about repairs, removing later uh, extensions that were causing damage to the building with water ingress and dry rot, um, and, and tried to plant this, this seed in the group that it is essential that there is a view as to how the salsa will be presented in the long term, so that any work that's done in the short term doesn't impede the long term presentation. Um, and I sort of at that time thought this would be a project that would go on for many years, but actually it, it sort of developed very quickly. This was my feasibility study. The green arrows from the main entrance into the back was trying to highlight that five, space, five steps in from the main street and suddenly you're presented with the town wallscape, and to just try and invent ways to bring people through so that they then get the view, which is the blue, blue arrows that you see. And then this was a little 3D sketch, again presented in the feasibility study, to try and crystallise that idea that by having a raised terrace you can look over the wall into the churchyard towards the town walls. And then the implementation of the project, the first phase started in spring 2015, a lot quicker than I thought. It stripped out the interior, there was a lot of dry lining, and lo and behold we were beginning to find Tudor fireplaces. And those fireplaces began to tell us how the building was subdivided. Um, and these are some of the details, the Tudor door case, Tudor fireplace, um, dislocated or uh, relocated window stones that we were able to incorporate into the scheme. Um, and the critical um, discovery was, I had a theory that I, I felt the facade, there were missing bits the one gable in the middle looked out of proportion compared to other Renaissance buildings of the time in Kilkenny that I had looked at. And then lo and behold, we discovered um, these window sills 
and we traced where the fireplaces were and we discovered that it actually was a three gables building. Um, now only the central gable is presented but quite clearly there were three gables there and I think that's a really exciting discovery and you can see the fireplace there which is another key indicator as to how the building was laid out. Um, so this is the interior, um, it's now an exhibition centre but this was at the end of the first phase of work where we had it open as a temporary exhibition centre. And then this is it at completion. Um, we put back a gable, um, views into the walls. Uh, it's now an equestrian experience linked to Coolmore Stud, who put up a lot of money to make this project happen. And uh, again, one of the heroes of this story. And you can see there on this side, the opening ceremony, which was conducted by Lord Andrew w Lloyd Webber, and the whole town turned out and the market square was full again. And that's the story of the three Renaissance houses. Thank you.